Welcome to the Produce Moms Podcast, where we believe there is a produce mom in all of us. I'm Lori Taylor, founder and CEO of the Produce Moms. For 10 years, I sold fresh produce to over 300 grocery stores in the U.S. And today, my team and I are fully focused on inspiring people to eat more fruits and vegetables. This show is just one of the ways that we hope to inspire you and your family to eat more produce and live a better life. If you like what you're hearing on the podcast, join our community of almost 40,000 in all 50 states and over 30 countries by visiting theproducemoms.com slash subscribe. And be sure to subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes. Thanks for being here. Enjoy today's show. Welcome back, everyone. Today is a really exciting edition of the Produce Moms podcast. We are welcoming uh, a brilliant man, Aiden Moat. He is the co-founder and CEO of Hazel Technologies. Hazel Technologies is, is a company that is passionate about saving food and resources. They're working to solve it, towards solving the problem of food waste, and everything's done in an eco-friendly and sustainable manner. So this is going to be a great episode. Aiden, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on, Lori. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, of course. So we got to start really just from the beginning. Please tell us your story. What is what is Hazel Technologies? How what did you do to discover it? Sure. Um, well, I guess uh, maybe I'll give a little bit of my own background just for um, edification. Please, yes. I did my PhD in chemistry um, at Northwestern. Um, while I was there, I became a fellow for a group called the Institute for Sustainability and Energy at Northwestern. Um, so I've, I've always built myself as what we would typically call a sustainability chemist. Um, and so as part of that fellowship, I got uh, uh, introduced to a lot of coursework that was focused on giving me a, a broader perspective on some of the challenges in sustainability in world systems. Um, and what resonated with me, I think, was that uh, you could see a lot of rapid changes happening in places like energy or transportation um, vis-a-vis, you know, creating more clean energy, reducing pollution from transportation, uh, burning of fuels and so forth. But uh, one thing that I didn't see a lot of forward progress in was agriculture. And I think that's fascinating Mm -hmm. because agriculture is the only industry that touches every single human being on the planet every single day of their lives. It is the central industry. Um, And what resonated with me in particular was that a lot of agriculture is supported entirely uh, by chemical processes. Um, So, you know, quite a lot of high volume uh, chemistry goes into making fertilizers and into fighting pests and so forth and so on. But you just don't see the same pace of innovation in that science that you do in uh, other elements of the world. So I, I looked at that and I said, well, this is something that I can actually uh, tackle with my particular skill set and my particular interests. Um, myself and the other co-founders got together and said, hey, you know, we can use these these sophisticated but highly sustainable biochemical techniques to control the shelf life of perishable uh, produce. And um, that was that was the genesis. So we took off. We incorporated about March of 2015, and we've been doing it ever since. Wow, that's so cool. So uh, I guess let's let's talk about the product specifically. Um, I mean, why from from your perspective? I mean, kind of touched on this, but I'd like to dive a little bit deeper. Why is your product so important to the fresh produce industry? And most importantly, how does it affect? consumers and moms like me oh sure i mean there's there's a lot of dimensions to that question all all i know (laughs) (laughs) i mean we we can end up talking about that all day um right i'll pick a couple i'll pick one that's that's very very interesting um there's a there's a whole class of chemistries that are being done right now in agriculture that are referred to as biopesticides so rather than thinking about sort of conventional chemical pesticides or, or fungicides which certainly, first of all, have a spotty history and application. So that's, you know, unfortunately where things like DDT came through and, um, you know, the current uh, concerns around chlorpyrifos and and, um, neonicotinoids and so forth. So um, there's a whole separate class of chemistries that are being done. And the idea is we can affect the same kinds of changes in produce, the same benefits without having to rely on organophosphates or, um, you know, halo carbons and things like that that are quite harmful. And some of what we do falls cleanly into that category. And so the idea is, okay, look, um, you know, we're deploying active ingredients. They're non-contact active ingredients. So everything that we do is atmospheric chemistry. Uh, So we leave no residue on produce. There's no interference with 
uh, human health or with flavor or with any of the things that we associate with the freshness of our produce, mm -hmm. uh, we can deploy very, very small amounts of actives and achieve very large impact. So, for example, um, our ethylene inhibition product, we're only using less than one ppm of active in the atmosphere. So, for reference, there's 440 times as much CO2 in the atmosphere right now um, as we need in order to be able to extend shelf life and produce by two or three fold uh, from its normal um, uh, its normal shelf life. So sure. where this becomes really interesting is when you start to think about the, the overall program of how farmers are keeping produce uh, fresh and, and able to, to move it through the supply chain. And one thing that, that can happen, and I think is happening already, is that if you have solutions like ours that are, are much more in the biopesticide version than the, the um, conventional chemistries, you can actually reduce the amount of chemical input you need overall. You can reduce the amount of chemistries you need to do to fumigate for uh, mold or for insects. You can extend the shelf life overall without having any further treatments. And so as a result, you, you end up in a, in a beautiful part of the reduce, reuse, recycle uh, thing where you're actually reducing the amount of chemistry overall by moving to a higher value, uh, cleaner and, and more sophisticated version of that chemistry. So I think that's something that's really exciting to me is, you know, first of all, from a resource adaptation perspective, look, if we can get away with applying a couple of milligrams of active instead of a couple of kilograms of active, uh, we're doing the world a favor in terms of, of, you know, CO2 footprint. We're doing the world a favor in terms of absolute chemical manufacturing requirements. And then there's this additional external benefit of reducing the amount of chemical residues and the amount of chemical inputs that go all the way down to the consumer. Um, by using this kind of non-contact system that we've developed. So yeah, no doubt. I think it's a pretty impressive, you know, focus that we've developed uh, over the last couple of years. Yeah, no, it's amazing. And I didn't, I mean, I've spent time on your website. I read about you in the produce trade journals um, and I didn't know all that. So thank you for sharing. Um, and it, it really kind of brings the product more full circle for me. So I think it's probably appropriate right now for you to actually describe the product to our listeners that are not familiar with Hazel Technologies. Sure, sure. So we, uh, I, I always joke that we, um, you know, we're an agricultural science company, but, but really we're actually a materials science company that's disguised as an agricultural company. Uh, <laughs> what we do is we make uh, what we call active packaging inserts. So these are um, sachets, pads, papers, and things that can be inserted into standard commercial packaging for bulk produce. Um, so I'll use an example, which is probably the, the easiest example. Um, we have uh, what we call an inbox sachet, and it looks... Uh, a lot like a silica packet that you would see in uh, like a beef jerky uh, plastic bag or a package of shoes or what have you. Uh, right. so, you know, two inch by two inch thing. It contains about a quarter gram of material that goes into a box. So our, our customers put that into a box. Uh, the box contains anywhere between 10 and 50 pounds of produce. So that's your, your master case, quote unquote, that's getting sold to your, your local grocery store. Mm -hmm. And uh, while it's in that box, the sachet contains a solid material that stores and time releases the active ingredient into the storage atmosphere of the produce during shipping and transit. And so we're basically continuously treating that atmosphere in order to extend the shelf life of that produce uh, throughout the duration of its life cycle. So anywhere from the packing point all the way downstream to when it's taken off and put into a retail shelf and, and sold. Sure. Yeah, it's fascinating. So it reminds me a little bit. Um, are you familiar with the, I'm sure you are, the um, Apple storage units, like in any Apple growing region, Washington State? It reminds me as you're talking, it kind of reminds yeah. me of that where they put the apples, you know, pallets and pallets of apples into these big storage units. They shut the door and then they change the atmospheric components so that, um, you know, they are, they are able to slow down the right. I mean, they essentially put the produce to sleep in those big rooms, but is yeah. it a similar kind of product then? Is that a similar process and goal is you want to, you, you just want to slow down the ripening of the fruit in the process? Well, the, the philosophy is kind of, I mean, it's a very insightful question actually. And I'll, I'll tell you uh, why in just a second after I answer your second part there. Okay. We, we, you know, we use a number of different actives. They're targeted at specific problems, right? So with a lot of produce, um, you know, just general respiration is an issue. The fact that the produce is living and breathing and, and essentially dying while it travels. Um, so we are able to control the, the metabolism of that produce through the ethylene pathway uh, 
Um, and by doing so, we can actually slow down the metabolic rate and therefore extend the shelf life literally by slowing the aging process. Right. But there's, you know, there's other problems that come up too. So you've got issues with uh, microbes, for example. So we have a line of products that's targeted at um, fungus stasis, which is essentially, you know, being able to maintain, uh, being able to reduce the speed at which mold populations grow. And therefore you can extend shelf life by reducing the harmful effects of bacteria and yeasts and molds and fungus. Um, so we, you know, we target AIs for the specific uh, purpose that we need in that category of produce, but the philosophy is the same, right? So in, in an Apple CA room, uh, you've got, uh, you know, like you said, you've got a million pounds of apples in a big room. You've got mm-hmm. an atmosphere where you're reducing the oxygen, you're uh, holding your CO2 uh, concentration steady. Um, and in a lot of cases, you're adding ethylene inhibition um, AIs into that, uh, that atmosphere as well, because apples are, are very, very easy to control in terms of their metabolism. Sure. Where that model breaks down is that apples are one of the slowest respiring categories of produce that exist. So it's, it's easy to fumigate a room that's filled with 10 million apples. But if you're, let's say you're doing avocados or you're doing melons that you can't store under those same conditions, you can't do that same kind of treatment. Now, what do you do? You know, how do you get access to that kind of atmospheric treatment? And so essentially what we did was we said, well, look, you know, these AIs, they're very functional. But the model that has existed to apply them is only applicable to a very small subset of crops. It's really only two or three crops that get this kind of treatment. So we right. could figure out a way to essentially democratize this kind of application so that you don't need to have a service technician. You don't need to do a, fu- a full-scale fumigation in order to make the unit economics work out. You don't need to worry about your worker handling and safety protocols so you can actually uh, treat stuff while it's moving instead of having to store it for long periods of time, uh, so forth and so on. And that's that's really where Hazel came from, was we saw that the market had plenty of fantastic AIs that are just being underutilized. And what it really needed was a better delivery mechanism, you know, a safer, more efficient delivery mechanism. And so mm-hmm. that's created. That's cool. That's cool. So talk about some of the products where, you know, Hazel is in those cases. Sure, sure. We're, we're active in quite a number of, uh, you know, what we typically refer to as specialty fruit and veg, uh, but really that covers the gamut from, um, you know, temperate crops, so apples, pears, cherries, uh, to stone fruit, uh, melons. Uh, we're doing a number of vegetables now, too, so we're doing okra. We've done some leafy greens and some herbs. Uh, we're in a lot of tropicals. So, you know, one of our biggest partnerships that we announced earlier this year was with Mission Avocado, the world's largest distributor of avocados. Yeah. So that's half avocado. And then, of course, we, we also work with the green skins coming out of the tropics. So Dominican yeah. Republic, Florida, um, and uh, Guatemala and Costa Rica, we're also doing work with them uh, across the whole gamut of avocados. So pretty soon, you know, especially as we start to move towards getting the retailers uh, to participate in our tech programs, um, there's going to be a scenario in which the vast majority of avocados sold all over the United States are maintained in perfect condition because of our technology. Okay. So that's really exciting. And you're, you're, so you're working right now, if we consider the supply chain folks, you're working right now with the, the farmers, you know, the growers and the shippers in this industry, the folks that are picking the produce and putting it in those large boxes, like you said, from, you know, 10 to 40 pounds. And then you put the, the hazel packet inside those boxes. Now your next phase, it sounds like you are engaging with the retailer. Is that correct? Is that a correct assessment on my end? Okay. So my question for you is Mm -hmm. you anticipate engaging with the end consumer households. Very much so. So there's, we've done something pretty radical. um, And, and it really has to do with how we've designed the deliveries. Again, this goes back to the question of, you know, if you have a better delivery system, what can't you do? And right. The, the, the modularity of the system uh, can't be overstated. I mean, we, we can treat anything all the way down to individually packaged clamshells. Uh, we, we, you know, we're even going to be moving into non-crop applications with some of our antimicrobial technologies. So there you're talking about things like fish fillets and chicken fillets and so forth. And at the end of the day, the, the chemistry is all grass. It's all generally regarded as safe. Uh, it's so modular that it can be put into a consumer fridge, it can be put into a, a, you know, a special box that a consumer can use on their countertop to keep their own fruits and vegetables fresh. Even people with home gardens can use that kind of technology. Wow. Uh, we really envision touching every segment of the supply chain. We, um, we, we started off with a pretty radical thesis, which is that most of the technologies that come out 
and are focused on shelf life preservation, they, they're, they're infrastructurally very heavy. They're difficult. Um, you know, you got a lot of high throughput sorted machines. You got a lot of sprayers. You got a lot of uh, bulk contact systems that require a lot of engineering and expense. And those typically are, are, those typically are driven by demand side economics in the market. We looked at that and we said, well, look, if we really want to percolate our technology through every level of the supply chain in order to extend shelf life of perishables you know, to the absolute maximum, then we need to have something that works at every level of the supply chain. We have to have something where the unit economics, the space requirements, and the application requirements are so democratic that anybody from a field packer doing okra in Honduras to the most technologically advanced retail supply cold chains that exist in the U.S., can integrate this seamlessly with what they've already got going on. And so when we approach the supply side of the market, the farmers and the growers, um, to be able to, to have a product that has unit economics they can take advantage of, that has an ease of application that requires them to make no disruptive changes to their packing order, um, really allowed us to get into that market much, much, much more quickly and with much more uh, vertical integration because we made it easy for them essentially. Mm -hmm. So when you start from that supply side, then everything else follows. Then the retailers look at it and they go, hey, you know, all of a sudden we're seeing tremendous shelf life benefits in some of our produce. Um, we need all of our people to be using this because that's what we really want to see is the, those benefits. And then they get to pass that on to the consumer and say, hey, you know, the reason you're having this fantastic eating experience is because we have this amazing tech partner that did, you know, that, that's, that's basically passing these values all the way down to you. And now you can have access to that technology as well. So we, we really do envision a world in which Hazel exists at every level of the supply chain from, from start to finish. And that allows us to essentially reduce food waste to zero is the goal. Yeah, no, and I'm I'm sold. I want that Hazel box on my countertop. <laughs> next year, next year, coming, coming 2020. I'll, uh, I'll get you on an advance order. <laughs> Good. All right. So this is, um, I mean, this has just been fascinating. I mean, I hope all of my colleagues in the produce industry tuned in today uh, because this, you know, we've been reading about your company. I feel like you have a lot of momentum right now, as you should, um, listening to your story and the solution that you provide. One thing I, I do want to emphasize before I kind of, you know, throw the mic back to you for the, for the final thoughts and closing word, I want to emphasize how this is really solving a global, you're part of the solution to a global crisis. And that crisis is food waste. Yeah. I mean, it's it, it, the, the size of the problem can't be overstated. About one third of all the produce harvested in the world every day goes to waste. Mm -hmm. so talking about, you know, 30 to 40% of our calorie supply. You're talking about a trillion dollars worth of loss all over the world. And, you know, there's, there's, to have perspective on this, every year we produce enough calories all across the world to feed every person on the planet. So people talk about, you know, how are we going to feed eight, nine, 10 billion people? Well, the, the answer is we're already producing those calories. Mm -hmm. we, we actually can do that. The question isn't how much more do we need to produce? The question is how good are our supply chains that we can get the food to where it needs to be? And even in the United States, you have this problem of food deserts, right? You've got uh, the most technologically advanced country that the world has ever seen. And yet at the same time, uh, you don't have a grocery store within 25 miles of some households in the Ozarks. And that's a, that's a tremendous poverty, but it's driven entirely by the problems of the supply chain. So we view solving world hunger as a supply chain problem, not a production problem. And that's why we have such a, a fanatical devotion uh, to ensuring that we can support, you know, every element of that supply chain, not just the technology to make sure that produce gets to where it needs to go, uh, but also to make sure that the economics are, are fundamentally sound for both the supplier and the consumer. And if you can connect all those things together, you got the horses and the cart all in one, and that's where we'd like to be. Mm. That is so good. Um, I am I am so excited to just to continue to watch you and your team, everyone at Hazel Technologies, all of the farmers that you're working with. Um, I just can't wait to see how you guys are going to continue to change the world. And and uh, it's just so exciting. Aiden, thank you so much for being our guest today. And uh, really, really appreciate it. I learned a lot. And I'm not... Uh, uh, this is not just lip service. I am a Hazel Technologies <laughs> fan and I want that Hazel Technologies box on my, uh, I want one in the fridge and on the countertop. How's that? So I will, I will get you hooked up, Lori. <laughs> uh, well, this has just been a true pleasure. Uh, you're a brilliant man doing incredible work. Please sign us off on today's show. Share whatever kind of closing remarks and final goodbyes you'd like with our listeners. 
Sure, sure. I mean, I, I so I feel like uh, as a chemist, I feel like I always have to impart, you know, a little bit of uh, scientific insight into the way the world around us works. And uh, I think this has always been a fascinating statistic for me. It's, it's really why I got into this um, industry. But uh, about three quarters of all the people that are alive today uh, are alive because of a single chemical process, which is the Haber-Bosch process. It was uh, discovered uh, 140-ish years ago, and it's the process by which we fix nitrogen into ammonia. So, and ammonia is the principal source of nitrogen and fertilizer, so that's how we grow our crops. So uh, it, it's crazy because the scale of this process is so large that it's estimated that about 40% of all of the nitrogen on the planet has been through this process at one point or another. Um, and as I mentioned, it, it, it's central to sustaining uh, the, the scale of agricultural operations to keep people alive. And the question that's always driven me and that, and that drives Hazel today is, okay, you know, we, we did that. We, we found a way to make agriculture so commercially viable, so economically viable, that the planet already sustains, you know, towards 8 billion people uh, today. But it doesn't mean that we're done. And it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be innovating uh, in the chemical sciences and in every, in every branch of science in order to make sure that we're not only meeting the goals of feeding people, but the goals of, of fixing a change in climate uh, and the goals of reducing economic uh, damage that's caused by the sciences that we put into place. So I think there's a, an important component of both sides of the conversation. I know this is very important to the consumer um, that we eliminate the negative externalities that are caused by scientific progress, even while we continually increase the, the output and the sustainability of that output throughout the world. And that's, that's how we're going to feed everybody on the planet. And that's the fight that we're here to fight. So I appreciate you uh, having me on the program. I, I hope this was enlivening and, and interesting for everybody. And uh, thank you very much, Lori. Thanks for joining us on this episode of the Produce Moms podcast. If you or someone you know would like to be a featured guest, just send an email to Lori at theproducemoms.com. We know there is a Produce Mom in you because there's a Produce Mom in all of us. Join our community on Facebook and all social platforms. Help us change the way America eats. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time.